First, let's address a few basic housekeeping items. Uh, please note this event is being recorded on both Zoom and Facebook Live. Be sure to keep your videos turned on, um, but your sound turned off. And I invite you to post comments in the chat throughout the event to share your thoughts and ideas and create conversation around what early childhood means to each of us. Finally, let's create a buzz on social media using the hashtag OurChildrenMN. Before we begin our program, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of Indigenous peoples. This land continues to hold great historical and spiritual significance and remain sacred to many people. We acknowledge the complex and multi-layered history that included violence and trauma. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm tribal sovereignty. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for sovereign tribal nations and indigenous peoples of the state of Minnesota and across the United States. Next, I'm going to introduce an icebreaker activity. All of our speakers today will share their answers to this question when they begin their remarks, and we invite you all to answer it in the chat. Our icebreaker question is, who was someone that was special to you as a child, and why were they important to you? So I'll start. Um, one of the most special people from my childhood is my home child care provider, Mary. Um, my brothers and I spent years in her care, and I will always remember her huge yard, the trampoline, and enormous sandbox. Most importantly, though, um, the relationships that were fostered through her care. I grew up playing with her grandkids, and we all still keep in touch. We'd love to hear about the special people from your childhoods, so please share in the chat while I introduce our first speaker, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. The Lieutenant Governor has a deep history in children's advocacy as the former Executive Director of Children's Defense Fund. She's a member of the White Earth Nation and the mother of a young daughter. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Tina. It is good to see you and to be here with everyone on one of my most favorite days uh, during the session as we are lifting up um, our, our children. So Buju, Peggy Flanagan, Indigenous Kaz, Guava Ba, Beganikag, Nindunjaba, Mangan Nindodame. My name is Peggy Flanagan. I'm a member of the White Earth Nation and my family is the Wolf Clan. Um, you know, as this question, I love this question. Um, who is someone who is special to you as a child and why were they important to you? Um, one of the things that I can say is that uh, I, it's hard to think about just uh, one um, person in my life, but I would say uh, that my second grade teacher, uh, Betty Fulkins at Aquila Elementary School um, always made me feel seen, heard, valued, and important. And one of my favorite things about um, Mrs. Fulkins is that she was totally unafraid to be herself. She had a gigantic poster of Magnum PI over our sink in our classroom um, and uh, taught me that we get to be our full selves in every space and place uh, where we are. And she celebrated all of the young people um, in her classroom. And that's the first time I ever thought I'd talk about Magnum PI in a speech. So here we are. Um, but you know, here we are uh, in this moment where we have a lot of momentum and it is incredibly exciting time to be an advocate for our children. Um, you know, this is the type of work that takes me back, uh, frankly, to my early advocacy days and knowing that too often the people who are most impacted don't have a voice at the table. I feel like our movement in this moment is starting to change that that we are centering the people who are most impacted to be able to advocate and to speak on their own behalf. Um, and that is uh, really clear. And I hope that you see some of that in uh, you know, some of the proposals that have been coming out of our administration. Um, but that is why the governor and I have been committed to making Minnesota the best place in the country to raise a family since our first day in office. Um, and while we have stood up new uh, programs and invested hundreds of millions in federal funds to stabilize the childcare industry and ensure access for families during the pandemic, there clearly is so much more work uh, to be done. 
which is why Governor Walls and I have proposed a really bold budget. And frankly, um, this is the budget uh, that, that I've been hoping for as a child advocate for a really long time, um, that invests $1.8 billion to support uh, child care and early education systems and the workforce. This investment includes $100 million in additional support to provide direct grants to continue uh, stabilizing child care providers who are facing financial burdens during the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal here is to serve approximately 2,000 child care providers across the state. Our budget also expands access to child care for Minnesota's children and families and creates more opportunities for providers to care for kids. Uh, this budget makes uh, over $900 million in investments in the child care assistance program. Not only will this invest in families um, and children currently benefiting from CCAP, but we would be able to uh, add about 32,000 additional families uh, to CCAP, virtually eliminate the wait list that we have heard about for far too long. Um, we also propose increasing the maximum rates of reimbursement to the 75th percentile, which provides stability for providers and will increase access and reduce out-of-pocket costs uh, for families. Um, uh, and so, you know, for 15,000 families and about 30,000 uh, children who depend on CCAP every single month. Um, the budget also forecasts a child care assistance program, and we propose expanding the definition of family to include foster care families uh, and guardians, adding an additional 2,000 participants to the, the CCAP program. So this will expand access to affordable care for lower income Minnesotans, and it will better compensate our child care providers who have really been heroes over the last two years. We have already known that they were heroes for a very long time, um, but to compensate them uh, for their work work. We're also we're adding 75 million annually towards uh, pathway one early learning scholarships, 225 million uh, over three years while prioritizing the pathway one funding to income eligible uh, children who are zero to three. So expanding that. The shift really recognizes that we need to offer supports earlier to children and their families, uh, especially our infants and toddlers, to support their optimal development, which all of you know, um, and, and give uh, families really a choice in which program that they, they want to attend. Um, and our budget provides funding so that more than 6,000 new four-year-olds can receive pre-kindergarten programming through a mixed delivery approach uh, provided uh, in license, licensed family, um, center-based, school-based, and Head Start settings. Um, again, this is a mixed delivery approach uh, that we wanna make sure um, you know, meets the needs of families, including licensed care providers, along with Head Start, who will receive about 60% of, of this funding. Um, I could go on and on about this budget because I'm very excited about it, but I won't. Um, I will just say you know, that we know how important this is, and I hope that um, uh, that, that you can see that we really mean it. We think about budgets, um, we know that they are fiscal documents, but at the end of the day, they are moral documents where you're naming what we care about and who we care for. Um, and I think everybody says that children are our top priority. Um, we need to make sure that we are matching our words with our actions. So with a quarter of Minnesota families uh, lacking access to uh, child care, uh, the Walls Flanagan administration is proposing flexible financial supports along with supports to build and maintain child care, um, both businesses and the workforce, including better access to technology for providers. Because we know, and finally, Finally, we are starting to feel this movement that childcare access is essential to our economic and workforce recovery as a state. Um, childcare is the backbone of the economy and we need to start giving it the respect that it uh, deserves. So this, you know, and these investments would result in 50,000 more uh, state funded child care and early learning program slots for children, making affordable quality care, um, you know, just accessible to, to more folks. So I know that I just gave you a lot of stats and numbers and, you know, all these things are important, but behind each of these numbers, behind every line item in our budget is a person is a child. And when we come back to all of the incredible people that you all have put into the chat who impacted you and influenced your life as a child, we have the opportunity to do that 
um, not just for individual children, but for so many children um, uh, and can need to carry that energy that Mrs. Fulkins, you know, had um, and saw in me that we can carry um, that forward for all of our, our kiddos. So the governor and I um, are honored and humbled to work shoulder to shoulder with all of you for our littlest, for our youngest Minnesotans um, and are just uh, honored to be in this fight. So thank you for all of the work that you have done and thank you for all of the work that we will do uh, this session and beyond to keep building the kind of state uh, where every child has an opportunity to thrive. Gichi miigwech, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I think if we were in person, that would have gotten so many cheers and just uh, the biggest applause. So um, really excited to have you advocating alongside us. Um, and I will say that you are very at home here with the mixed delivery approach. We're all very big fans. So thank you again. Um, before we hear from our parent, provider, and advocate speakers. I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen Rosenberger, Director of Advocacy and External Engagement at Greater Twin Cities United Way for a few more opening remarks. Wonderful, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's and this year's Advocacy for Children Day. Um, I wanna just say again, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to come together and share your voices in support of our younger um, children. And we're just honored as United Way to host this event. It's co-sponsored with the Start Early Funders Coalition and the very many partners who have helped plan and support this event. And just wanna take a moment to thank Lieutenant Governor Flanagan for her remarks and the support of her and Governor Waltz for early childhood. Um, clearly, we all know that a child's first years are vital to supporting a healthy start with 90% of brain development occurring by age five. And an important part of this development, we, we need to always make sure we keep in mind, includes a nurturing of stable, healthy relationships, which brings me back to my own childhood and memories of growing up with my sister. Um, she's only two years older than me, but always seemed like very worldly and inspired me to step out of my comfort zone to push myself, whether it was you know climbing the big tree in her front yard or going to school together on my first day of kindergarten. And I knew she loved me for better or for worse. Um, and there are a lot of days that were for the worst over the years, but she always stood by my side. And I think, you know, unconditional love and acceptance is a very powerful force and really gives us the foundation and the confidence to explore the world around us. And so that's why it's just so important that all children have experiences that build positive relationships as often and as early as possible. And that's really why we're all here together today. We want to improve access to high quality, culturally competent care and learning, investing in early learning scholarships and the child care assistance program. We want to support healthy children and families through voluntary home visiting programs. And we want to fully support and compensate our early care workforce to build a strong and stable child care system. But despite these important benefits, we know the data, we know the facts, Nearly 31,000 children do not have access to quality care and learning opportunities in our state today. And these gaps, unfortunately, are most prevalent for children under three and disproportionately impact families of color and parents in rural communities, which often hinders their ability to fully participate in the workforce. So again, we're here today to let legislators know, state leaders know we need to do better. Our children, our families, our workforce, cannot wait and the time is to act now. So again, thank you for being here today and advocating for our littlest learners. Thank you for helping us set the stage today, Kristen. Um, our next speaker, Sue Staffke, wears many hats. She is the Executive Director of Children's Corner Learning Center, Chair of the West Central Child Care Directors Association, and Faculty and Program Director for the Early Childhood Program at M State. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. I think I got unmuted finally. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. There's, I certainly have a passion for early childhood um, as I've been in this career for 31 years. Actually this year, I'm finishing my 31st year in educating our students in becoming early childhood educators. I started a program um, for M-State College up here in uh, Northwestern Minnesota 
And I started it 31 years ago. And for the last 16 years, I've also been able to be the executive director of a nonprofit child care center located in both Fergus Falls and Perm, Minnesota. And in case you're not aware of where those locations are, um, if you go up towards the lakes area, that's exactly where we're located. So I can speak on behalf of center directors up in this region as I I am a chair of our West Central Directors Association, of which I'm very proud of. And I can speak on behalf of rural Minnesota and why it's so important that we continue to do the work that Lieutenant Governor um, Flanagan talked about this morning, which is so vital. So thank you for that. I will start by sharing um, what we are asked to share. And the person who probably influenced me the most or had the most impact on me, which I, I don't think would be weird to say would be my mom but I will share with you just very quickly. Um, as a senior in high school, I actually was involved in a very serious car accident and I had a traumatic brain injury. At that time, I was told by a doctor that I should not continue on with my education, that I would not be capable of finishing um, and being successful in my education. And it was my mom that looked at me and said, he has no idea who you are and I do. So you're going to continue and you're going to go to college and you're going to become a teacher because that is what you told me you wanted to do from first grade on. And so that's why the influence for my mother is there. She's 85 years old and she's always been the biggest cheerleader that I ever have. But without her pushing and telling me I could still do it, I might, I might have given up at that moment. So I will share that with you. I'm here to advocate on behalf of continuing the support and um, education of our workers and understanding our workforce issues. And I know it's common. We've talked about this a long time, but long before the pandemic, child care center directors already knew that we were in crisis because we've been in crisis for years. This isn't new to us. The pandemic just brought it out. It advertised it more than what we've ever had before. And your child care center directors have been at the forefront. We have answered the call that we were asked to. We stayed open, we, we downsized our classrooms, we sanitized till we couldn't sanitize anymore. Um, we've had to close classrooms. We've had to lose money because we had to close classrooms. Um, and in between all this, we've lost staff. We've lost valuable staff for many, many reasons. Some of them because they were concerned about health some of them because they ended up having to also stay home and care for children because possibly that's um, what they needed to do. They needed to help with online learning and all the things that happened during the pandemic. What also happened during this time though, is all of a sudden our communities realized how important childcare is and how it contributes so much to our economic development and growth. And you don't have to go any further than to a center director for us to share with you the stories that we have had to live and go through. I have heard multiple stories from center directors who have had to stand at their center door in the, in the morning and tell parents that they're so sorry, but they don't have enough staff and that they couldn't enter that day because they were a room short or they had to call parents on the phone and let them know, I'm so sorry, but we are short staffed tomorrow and we're going to have to close your room tomorrow. Having a competition that we have for staff with gas stations, with Walmart, with McDonald's, all the fast food chains is something that I think our state doesn't want to continue. I think we want to make sure that we aren't the competition, but we are the choice. We want to be the choice for people to come and work with children. And in order to be that choice, we need this continued support from our state to be able to offer competent wages and benefits to people who deserve them, who work hard for them, um, and who are there supporting and taking care of the littlest learners with the greatest growth um, brain you know, development potential that anybody ever has in their lifetime. I think that it's important for us to continue that call. I think it's important that we remain steadfast. I think it's important that we continue to value the worth of our early childhood professionals, because if we don't, who will? So it is important that all of us here today continue down that path and support that path. And I stand behind the, the budget that was proposed for early childhood and I'm thrilled to hear that. I have testified 
in different legislative events for different bills, and I'm going to continue. I, in fact, I get to I get to um, speak on behalf of a bill next Tuesday, and I will continue to do so as long as I'm up and moving and talking and breathing. I will continue to do so. But I think we all have to. I think we all have to step up. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because this is the best group out there to do so. But I'm just here to say, please continue that support, how important it is. And I thank everybody for participating today. And thank you for asking me to be a part of it. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much, Sue, for being here. Um, it sounds like you live and breathe early childhood and we're very grateful to have you on our team advocating. Um, let's see here. While many parents access childcare through centers such as Sue's, uh, many parents find that family, friend, or neighbor care is what works best for them. So now let's turn our attention to a video submitted from our friends at La Red, a community created program designed to train and support family, friend, and neighbor providers. Hola, mi nombre es Ruth Evangelista y yo soy un familiar, amigo y vecino, cuidador de niños y pertenezco a la red platina de educación temprana, Minnesota. Hola, mi nombre es Fabiola Martínez de Estrada y también soy una proveedora de cuidado infantil aquí en Minnesota y pertenezco a la Red Latina de Educación Temprana. Hola, mi nombre es Virginia Márquez y esta es mi historia. Soy originaria de Jalapa, Veracruz, México. Vivo en Minneapolis, Minnesota por 21 años. Soy una abuela proveedora de, cuidados, de cuidado infantil con 12 años de experiencia. Gracias a los entrenamientos de la Red Latina de Educación Temprana, y en mi idioma y que son gratis, yo he aprendido a sobrellevar el cuidado infantil con, con más confianza y he hecho de, de mi casa un lugar seguro, un lugar de un ambiente cómodo para los niños y que ellos se sientan como en familia. También los padres están sintiéndose a gusto porque traen a los niños a un lugar donde Vienen a aprender donde sienten la comodidad en la casa y ellos ven que es como si fuera un daycare, cualquier otro que, que estuvieran pagando. La red latina con sus entrenamientos y fondos para nuestros materiales hace accesible a mi trabajo, elevando mejor calidad con los, las certificaciones que nos están dando y yo tengo un lugar seguro y las personas confían en mí porque saben que soy una persona que me sigo preparando. Mi trabajo es importante porque rompe con las barreras de iniquidad en mi comunidad y hacen que los niños y las familias sean exitosos. Me gustaría que la legislatura se comprometiera en el trabajo de los proveedores, familias, amigos y vecinos, dándonos fondos y dándonos acceso y apoyo a organizaciones como la red que tienen sus raíces en la comunidad y me gustaría que mi trabajo sea visible para todas las personas en nuestra comunidad de, de donde yo estoy. Uh, did I, the, I think the video may have gotten cut off, but um, we'll figure out that on our end. And I think maybe we'll, while we're doing that, we can um, just introduce our next speaker. Um, and thank you so much for uh, Virginia, Ruth, and Fabiola for sharing your stories. I hope we can um, cut back and finish that. Oh, okay. Maybe that was the end of the video. I apologize. I, I, anyway. <laughs> Um, our next speaker is Dr. Monica Potter, the District Coordinator for St. Paul Public Schools and has spent many years supporting early learning through school-based programs. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, children, parents, and all of you here today to support our future, our children. I'm Dr. Monica Potter, and I'm the supervisor of Early Childhood Family Education, uh, ECFE, 
And I'm also here to share information about school-based programs for our early learner, our early learners, our early childhood special education programs, pre-K programs, and early childhood screening. Uh, in sharing my favorite and most beloved teacher, that role uh, goes to my mother. I see that many of you also put your mothers in this category. My mother had an early childhood license. She taught second grade until I was born. And what I most learned from her is her unconditional love and acceptance. And I feel so grateful to continue to learn from this amazing lifelong teacher, mentor, and my best friend. Like other speakers today that have been discussing some of the issues in early childhood, school-based programs face the same issues. Um, we face decreasing um, money for our programs, uh, we also face shortages in teachers and staff and wage issues. But today I'd really like to pay tribute to the accomplishments and the things that happened during the pandemic. And I wanna begin with a story of a single parent. Um, she was parenting her eight week old and just after the pandemic hit, she signed up for an online ECFE class. And not only one, she signed up for four, four online classes a week for herself and her daughter. And she shared with me in a note that she honestly didn't know what she would have done without the classes. She said they learned so much. They met other parents and children that offered support and guidance and they didn't know that what they have done without us. So I also wanna highlight in early childhood, the parent education um, that happens for families because it's not just for our children, it's for families that we do what we do. This story represents similar um, experiences that have happened in school-based programs across the state. We offered more than education. We offered acceptance, support, and hope. Many parents shared with us through this pandemic that we have been their lifeline. And when we had to switch gears really quickly, we're really grateful for the funding that we do have from the state. And all programs across the state switch gears quickly to support families' new needs during the pandemic. We had classes online. We had classes inside buildings, outside buildings in pre-K. We had online screening, online home visits that we provided for families. We provided parent education inside and outside buildings. We distributed family learning packets to families' doors. We distributed food to families. And we also took care of and provided care for essential workers' children. We filmed parent education classes and provided them across the state. And a few rural programs band together and they created ECFE in a bag where they gave families information, books, and activities to work on. So during this pandemic and all the challenging issues, I'm so proud of early childhood programs in Minnesota. They listened to families' concerns and needs, adapted to the new situation, provided resources, support, connection, and mostly love. Thank you, Minnesota, for your awareness and your support for children across the state of Minnesota. I'd also like to share one more parenting story with you. 
this parent has been with us with her two sons for the past two years. And she wrote to us and said, our two young boys have learned so much from their teachers and from the relationships they've formed in class. The support and education that my boys and I have received through ECFE has been instrumental. Because of ECFE, I am a better parent and my children are growing into better human beings. ECFE has been life changing for us. Thank you everyone here today for prioritizing families and supporting a healthy start for our youngest learners, our future, our hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Potter. Um, and it sounds like from our tech team that I was the only one who had a video issue and it froze on me, but I hope that wasn't happening to anyone else. So um, again, thank you, Dr. Potter. Um, in addition to our many advocates working on the ground with children every day, we also have strong advocates at the Minnesota legislature. We are so excited to have Senator Duckworth with, with us today. He's on the Senate Education Committee and has three little ones at home. Well, hello there. Uh, I appreciate the invitation and you are correct. I do have three little ones at home. Uh, I've got a six-year-old, a four-year-old and a three-month-old. So uh, my house is uh, busy, as you can imagine, full of a lot of fun, a lot of laughter. Um, a lot of tears at times too, especially when it comes to uh, bath time and bedtime. But uh, our, our little kids are, are top of mind uh, in my household and on a daily basis. So first and foremost, uh, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy days to be here to advocate for our kids all across the state of Minnesota. Um, it's obviously extremely important, one of the most important and valuable things that we can do uh, in terms of setting them up for future success. Uh, I first kind of entered into public service on the school board in Lakeville, primarily because uh, I wanted to see our kids succeed and achieve uh, to, to their best ability in school and academically. Uh, and I think it sets such, such an important foundation for them uh, and for our communities, to be honest with you. And that's why it's a, an honor to serve on the Education Committee in the Senate as well. Uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I talk about how important our kids are in their education, but now more than ever, um, as uh, our kids in our schools continue to recover from what they've had to go through the last couple of years, uh, making sure they have the time, attention, tools, and resources they need to help all of our kids, to help our teachers in classrooms uh, recover and get back to uh, a sense of stability and a sense of certain, uh, certainty is crucial. Now, obviously, uh, you know, everybody has different thoughts on how we can go about uh, doing or achieving that. But what I do know is at the end of the day, uh, you do see uh, all parties typically come together and try to find some forward movement when it comes to our kids, their schools and putting them, uh, putting them first. Uh, just to give you an idea, this morning, I was at a, a nonprofit organization in St. Paul that does phenomenal after school programs for our kids coming out of St. Paul schools and across the state. Um, you know, later this morning, I had a meeting with somebody who is trying to implement a program into schools. It's already in some of our schools here that help them reimagine or rethink really the entire school day and approach it from a team concept so that we build, really build and foster strong relationships between the students, teachers, and parents to help uh, improve their academic success, help improve their social emotional well being, and make sure that we're, we're doing right by our kids. So, um, like I said, uh, I know you all already share these same sentiments, but um, you know, for those of us here in the legislature that are working to try to bring some of, thing, some of these things about, they're listening to you advocates and trying to help us uh, get bills approved and put things in action. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your tireless work, your efforts, your pleas, the passion that you bring to this process. It's extremely important, and I hope you find it as, as rewarding as we do. Thank you so very much for your time and for being here. Thank you, Senator Duckworth, for advocating for young children at the Capitol. So early learning and care also has strong advocates in the business community. I'm really excited to introduce you to our next speaker, Jonathan Weinhagen. He's the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Chamber and a member of uh, Itasca's, Itasca Project's first thousand days task force, which he'll tell you more about. Well, 
Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. I will echo the sentiments of all of our speakers today. Um, in addition to um, that introduction, I'm also the father of four, uh, so four boys. A couple of them are within earshot, so my apologies if they uh, come into the, the camera lens. I also chair one of the largest school districts in the state. So uh, I have not graduated as Senator Duxworth has um, beyond school board chair. Uh, he and I may uh, tackle which is more glamorous the last two years, uh, serving in the Senate or on the school board. Um, real quick, somebody who is special to me, I will uh, kind of keep the, the drumbeat rolling. My mom, uh, stay-at-home mom, raised six kids. She was our teacher, our our lunch lady, our you know electrician, plumber, um, the whole works in the household. Um, and then after raising six kids, uh, went on to serve our school district um, for 25 years and recently retired and is entering her next chapter. So a great hero in my life. Um, excited to be here today, uh, not just to advocate um, on behalf of uh, child care and early childhood learning, uh, but to share a little bit of information about um, Itasca's work on the first thousand days. As mentioned, I am um, one of the task force members. The business community has a long history of investing in and, and working to better understand childcare as a business issue. And we've heard a lot of that today through, through various speakers. And, you know, Itasca starts from a set of data. Um, so we had the opportunity to really begin to explore and understand prenatal to, to age three. So those, you know, critical first thousand days of life. Um, I will tell you, my youngest son was eight years old at the time. So as I uh, listened to the researchers and, and learned all of the things, I was like, oh, crap, um, I, I missed the mark. Um, but we have a huge opportunity when we think about you know, these types of investments and, and ensuring the future of, of our young people. You know, from a, a business standpoint, you know, research would tell us you know, there's a 7 to 8% return on investment when we look at the, the continuum of investing in childcare, you know, education, healthcare, the criminal justice system, all of these things are impacted for generations. Um, and I would tell you as a business guy, seven to 10% return um, is pretty darn good. Um, the focus of the Itasca project has been to share the story um, you know, with employers and with employees uh, to adopt family um, friendly practices and policies and to support increased funding, which is a part of what we're doing here today as we talk to the legislature, as we lift up this, you know, this need to invest. Um, I appreciated uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's uh, remarks with regards to you know, early childhood and early child care and child care generally being you know, an economic and workforce recovery issue. As we think about you know, ending this pandemic, moving forward, um, we know we had a crisis before, we're certainly experiencing it today, and we should be leaning into that. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about with regards to the work that Itasca has led on is you know, a, a couple of things. One is a toolkit for employers, large and small, to help them you know, provide access to resources and opportunities and benefits and information to their workforce. Um, you know, that's something that is being piloted and we expect to expand um, you know, across our state and, and potentially even be a national pilot um, to help companies all across the country. Um, and as we talk to and survey benefit directors at, at companies, you know, this is all about improving employee well-being and performance. And it's something that in, in this time, we think about the, the job crises, um, the workforce shortage um, across all industries and all sectors. Um, every single company that I talk to is thinking about how do we do better to support our, our employers and our employees? And what does that look like? Um, we know that there's a direct impact on our economy. Um, you know, the impact of this childcare crisis, again, didn't start yesterday, it didn't start two years ago. It's been ongoing, all of you know that. Um, we know that in our state, 75% of, of mothers are working. Um, that is unprecedented. It is you know, top in the nation. We also know that 75% of mothers and 50% of fathers have made a decision about whether or not they work or you know, whether or not they take a job as a direct result of access to childcare and the opportunity to access those benefits. So this is, it's a critical issue to the business community. It's something that is getting you even greater national attention. The US Chamber has been focusing in on some data. You know, they, they assess just in four states, a, a cost of $11 billion to businesses as a result of absenteeism, turnover, um, and just lack of access to workforce. So 
we talk about this as an economic issue. It absolutely is. Um, but I think I'll end where the Lieutenant Governor began. And that's you know, behind all of the data and all the stats and, and we can all share it and we, we all hear it and we all know it. Um, there's little people. Um, and that's what this really should be about. Um, and I'm not sure that I've heard anybody talk about $9.253 billion that's floating out there. Um, but that's something we should be thinking about as well as we think about the near-term and long-term solutions around childcare and an investment in our future. So grateful to all of you who are on the ground doing the important work um, and really appreciate the invitation to speak today. Thanks so much, Jonathan. We're so grateful to have the support of business leaders like you. Now we are about halfway through our program and I think this is a great time to pause for an adorable reminder from our friends at way to grow about why we're all here today. Man, it's too big. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Hi, Abdullahi. Hi, Abdullahi. Hello. My name is Yam Donia. My name is Saya. My name is Bisana. A microphone. Try to test it. Like, say something very loud. Hello, hello. That's not working. Testing, testing. What are you doing? I like I join to see one one. Piggy buck, baby buck. Mermaid tails. Awesome. Thank you, Way to Grow, for putting that together for us. Um, that video has brought me just so much joy over the course of this uh, planning and preparing for today. So we've heard from many people today who play such an important role in shaping our children's lives and future. And now it's time to hear from a parent, the first and most important provider. Nikki Graff is the mother to two young children, and we're grateful to have had her as part of the planning team for this event. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, like she said, I'm Nikki Graff and someone that was really special to me when I was young is my baby sister. So she didn't teach me a lot being older than me, but being younger than me taught me a lot. And so uh, she's my best friend now and was back then. So she just gave me a lot to learn from. So that's my person. Um, Currently, I work at Child Care Aware and I co-facilitate Care Fellowship. So a shout out to Care Fellows who are on here. Um, Care Fellowship is a cohort of early educators and professionals who come together each month and grow their skills in advocacy and public policy. But my other full-time job is being a mom to three kids under the age of four, which is really why I'm here. Um, I have two daughters, one is four and one is two. And recently they attended a childcare program near our school. We love the location, we love the teachers, we love the community, but really struggled to send them both full-time. Over the span of seven months, we adjusted our youngest daughter's attendance from five days a week to three days a week to one day a week to now being home with us full time because we couldn't afford her tuition and stay caught up on our bills. 
the child tax credit kept us afloat um, when childcare costs more than our mortgage, but when it ended, we just couldn't keep our heads above water. So she's at home now. Um, at the same time of all of that happening, we were asked to adopt a little boy who is also two and he has been in foster care since birth. And so of course we said yes, and we planned as much as we could before he moved into our home, but the sticking point was childcare. Our daughters attended a school that was not parent aware rated and our son had an early learning scholarship. So right off the bat, we were really disheartened to learn that we couldn't send all of them to the same school. And then out of the 15 schools I did call, only three of them had openings and each phone call ended with, it's not that we don't have room for him, it's that we don't have teachers or we have an interview on Friday. So hopefully that person will show up and make it through the background check and you just can call back in a week and find out. And following that week, I, I called and toured childcare programs in between Zoom meetings at work and nap time. And eventually we found a school for him and he started a few weeks ago. I'm not sure how many of you have gotten three small children dressed, fed, and out the door alive and sent to two different schools multiple days in a row, but that was shy of a miracle and honestly only works if you do not hit the snooze button six times at 5 a.m. in the morning. That lasted just a couple of weeks, but I'm personally still very exhausted. Our daughter and our oldest, our oldest daughter and our son now attend the same school, but as I mentioned, our youngest daughter is still home because she's now on a wait list for the toddler room until May. So for our family, childcare feels like a three-legged stool with one wobbly leg, one leg being affordable, one leg being available near you at the time that you need it, and the last leg being high quality in a place that you love and trust for your kids. And you only are able to pick two of the strongest legs and hold on for as hard as you can and hope you won't topple over. So if I really had an ask as a parent, it would just be to fix the dang stool. We all need all three legs. And if we did, we can unclench our grips, grips, stand on top of it and grab the things that me and my children want and need on shelves that we currently cannot reach. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki, for sharing your story. And I, my mistake, I didn't realize you had three little ones at home. <laughs> um, now I'd like to welcome Representative Damoth of Cold Spring, who has been such a champion of early child excuse me, early child education. Thank you. It is good to be here with all of you um, today. I appreciate the work and the advocacy that each one of you are doing for our youngest and our littlest Minnesotans. A little bit about me, I am from uh, Cold Spring area, so central Minnesota, um, center part of the state in Stearns County, but I'm also a mom of four and a grandma of four with two more to come just a little bit later this year. So I, am, I have been for years immersed in the early childhood world. I did have the opportunity to serve on my local school board for 11 years, and that was a great um, way to be an advocate for early childhood and all the way up through graduation. One of the things that I know is true is that if we have healthy families, our communities are healthier. And if our communities are healthy, we know we can help those families become healthy also. So it really works in tandem. But as I was preparing for a few minutes for today to be with you, I tried to think of who um, had the most impact on me as a young person. That of course is my mom um, and the work that she did in raising me, but also my grandmother. So when my mom went to work, it was my grandmother that was a childcare provider, but also provided care for me. And that nurturing environment, a love for reading. She had encyclopedias that we could look at if we washed our hands first, but her love for learning at an early age was so important. And then my kindergarten teacher that accepted me where I was. I looked a little different than most of the students in my class, but she accepted me and wanted to see me achieve and to learn. Her name was Mrs. Easter Day, and she actually passed away just a couple years ago. But when I think of what we could do for our kids across the state, um, access to child care is so important. And that is all, you know, it is what families need so that when the families go to work, they know their kids are being cared for in a nurturing and learning environment. But that also allows families and parents to become the employees that each one of our employers need. We have a workforce shortage. We know we had that prior to the pandemic and it only made it more difficult. 
specifically in greater Minnesota, the flexibility of potentially pathway one scholarships that would travel with the student or with the child can be more flexible rather than just going to a program and then if family needs change, it makes it more difficult. But um, the challenge that our work, our employers are facing, some of the ways that we can look to solve those is what can we do in maybe the way of tax credits or um, offering solutions that employers can find unique to what they need that would best benefit their community and the workforce that we have. I'm going to be able to turn off my camera in a couple minutes and listen a little bit more. I appreciate what I've heard so far. Definitely appreciate the work and the advocacy that each one of you are doing. And as a legislator, I can tell you the best thing is for us to hear directly from constituents and from groups what works. You know, we're not in a vacuum. We need to work together to come up with solutions. So I would invite you to reach out to either myself, I sit on the Early Childhood Committee, um, or your local legislator and just let them know this is what's working. Here's an idea. And how could we pull together funding and creative solutions to make it better for Minnesota? Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, um, and I hope to listen and learn a little bit more as you continue on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Damas, uh, for being here today and for all your hard work advocating for children. Next up, we'll hear from Erin Bailey, Assistant Commissioner and Executive Director of the Governor's Children's Cabinet. Thank you so much, Tina, and thank you United Way, Start Early Funders, and all the organizers for putting together such an important day. I could not imagine a place I'd rather be than at the Advocacy for Children Day. I truly wish we were at the Capitol, but instead I'm coming to you from the baby's nursery. I, um, like others, love this prompt, and I thought I would be on my own with choosing my mom, but I'm sticking with it. Um, my dad died when I was a child, and while that was formative for me in many ways, and networks of support and privilege helped to lift me up, my mom was a single parent, and it was her overdrive through so many challenges that has truly made me who I am and allowed me to be here today. Uh, for those of you who know me, you would know that I uh, live out what she taught me, which is to never take no for an answer. And it's that perspective that has brought me to the work as executive director of the Governor's Children's Cabinet working in children's advocacy for much of my career, being able to serve the governor and lieutenant governor with a simple charge to center children and state government. And like so many of you, I'm a daughter, a sister, a very proud aunt and mother of two. The mission is personal to me. And the fact is that children unite us. They are our future and our overall well-being of a state depends on their success. The children's cabinet is charged with being a cross-agency convening around a children's agenda and believing that 1.3 million children and their families must be our state's top priority. We relaunched the Children's Cabinet in 2019 and it includes 22 commissioners chaired by the governor and lieutenant governor, believing strongly that leadership needs to be engaged in the work that we do. Our call to action is to align people, data, money, and policy around children. And we've built one of the nation's most action-oriented cabinets with outcome goals, cross-agency teams, convening around improving the lives of children beginning prenatally. We believe that there are opportunities to improve effectiveness of service delivery in our current systems, and we need to do that work. It's essential for our children and families. Uh, our work focuses in a number of areas, uh, including infant and parental health, specifically gut-wrenching, unconscionable disparities that we face in Minnesota for Black and Indigenous babies and parents. Child care and early education access and affordability, which you all um, uh, are talking so much about today and here to move work at the Capitol. Mental health and well being, recognizing the need for mental health supports, begins early in life and continues uh, for families. Housing stability and working towards the goal that no baby is born into homelessness in the state of Minnesota. And educational opportunity, pushing for every child in the state to receive a world class education. This work means ensuring that each and every policy that comes across the governor's desk is evaluated for its impact on children. And I can't say, I can say that I think that is incredibly visible in the governor and lieutenant governor's budget. You heard so much about incredible investments uh, in that budget. And I um, am proud that you all are at the Capitol 
uh, or will be in, in meetings and advocating to move forward these critical, critical investments. The budget is a $5.1 billion package. I'll say, Jonathan, I will talk about it. Um, and it's an opportunity for the, stack to, the state to enact priorities that children, youth, families, and advocates have long been asking for. As a parent of two young children, I wanna personally thank you. Thank you for being here, for having your voices heard, and for lifting up the voices of families. And I also wanna thank the mini Sues and other providers out there, Miss Vicky, Miss Mercedes, Miss Reina, I will never forget looking you in the eye as classrooms were closed as we began COVID and for how you've loved up and cared for my babies and our family each and every day for the last two years. Thank you. And before I close as the convening uh, enterprise for the 22 agencies around a children's cabinet, I also wanna thank the state leaders and commissioners who have worked to center children in our budget and the work they do every day. Please consider me and the Children's Cabinet team a partner to you, a front door to state leadership and to the collective work of prioritizing children in state systems. Let's get to work and let's not take no for an answer. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, in addition to the models of care we've heard about so far, many families benefit from home visiting. Our next speaker, Claudia, will um, talk about her work as uh, a registered nurse and a family home visitor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Claudia Montefering. I'm excited to join you today as an executive committee member of the Minnesota Coalition for Family Home Visiting. I'm a registered nurse and a family home visitor. As a family home visitor, we work to assist families in the perinatal period, which includes the time during pregnancy in the first year postpartum. For some families, they choose to continue working with family home visitors for up to two years. Family home visiting is a proven strategy to improve pregnancy and birth outcomes for their child, address maternal and infant health needs, support development of secure attachment with their children, address breastfeeding and feeding questions and concerns, and connect families to community resources to address the unique needs of each family. Community resources and services include childcare, early childhood classes, infant and early childhood mental health services as well as access to food, housing, and employment services. Our goals are to empower mothers to support their child's cognitive development, improve health outcomes, and work towards self-sufficiency through education and employment. Working in rural Minnesota, I know how important family home visiting programs are in assisting mothers and families address mental health, substance abuse, domestic abuse, isolation, or past trauma. We work hard to help stabilize families through home visiting prevention services and often see the best results when parents really engage with their home visitor. Finally, I want to share that COVID has had a disproportionate impact on families. Babies born during the pandemic are showing increased cognitive and developmental delays. That needs to be addressed early to prevent a lifetime of ongoing challenges. Additional resources and attention to these families will be critical as we build back from the pandemic. Ultimately, we want to increase access to voluntary early childhood services and help families and their children. I hope you will join me in encouraging the legislature to support families with young children and ensure that each child has the opportunity to reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for joining us on, uh, from work today. Our next speaker, Aisha Jackson, has the unique perspective of being both an early care provider who opened her center in February of 2020 and a parent of a little one born, I believe, just a few months ago. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, so my grandmother was and still is very special to me because of her wisdom, dedication, love, and patience. She is the reason I decided to join the child care field and she was a licensed family child care provider until she retired. And I just remember rushing to her, her house after school just for her delicious warm meals. Um, so I am a family child care provider in Minneapolis. I opened my program in February of 2020, about a month before the official outbreak of COVID-19. I immediately had fears of the future of my newly opened business and the well-being of my family. Being a mother, I know that access to affordable, high-quality child care is essential 
and I am committed to serving children in my community from all backgrounds. And I felt that it was my ethical responsibility to keep my program open. High quality care makes children feel safe and secure, improves cognitive and language development, social and emotional development, and prepares them for kindergarten. With everything going virtual, I spent more time on training, professional development, networking, and mental health. There is so much support within the child care field, and my business would not have survived without their help. I have worked with First Children's Finance, Think Small, Parent Aware, Child Care Aware, Minnesota Reading Corps, Provider's Choice, and of course, Care Fellowship, um, other providers, and so many other organizations. I was so grateful to receive support beyond tools and guidance, such as grants, for forgivable loans, and donations. These resources provided help with paying rent, my helper, purchasing furniture, and supplies, food, mental health services, and more. I was able to pass many of these resources to families in my program and community. As we know, there are staffing shortages in nearly every industry. It is more challenging to, to recruit and retain qualified educators in family child care. Workers seek wages that I can't afford without increasing costs for parents. Being a child care provider is hard work and very demanding. I have been temporarily managing this problem by caring for fewer children. My program serves five children currently, and I also have my own four children that I support during distance learning. Plus, I just had a new baby in December of 2021. Without a substitute, I struggle to maintain prenatal visits and adequate rest. We invest time, money, and do work beyond caring for children. Due to the added financial stress, many providers and other child care workers are deciding to leave the field. Providers like me are not valued as we should be. I care about quality and am always open to learning more so that the children I serve are getting the best possible start. I care about my education and have earned an AA degree and a four-star parent aware rating. But unlike in other fields, when you increase your qualifications in childcare, there is often little to no opportunity for increased compensation. We are calling for support and urgent action from state and local governments, along with the federal government for the economy to survive. We need to pro provide new learning opportunities for children and help parents make ends meet to support young children's social emotional health and the stress on families. The increased wages, benefits, and support created by the Build Back Better plan would greatly help me and so many other providers I have known and worked with within my career. Thank you so much for listening to my thoughts. Thank you so much for being here, Aisha, and sharing your experiences with us. Um, I see we're just over time, so I'm going to turn it over to Allison Corrado to do a call to action and closing remarks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tina. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Corrado. I work with the Blue Cross Foundation, and I co-chair the Start Early Funders Coalition's Public Policy Committee. We are over. I'm going to wrap us up. We have a call to action, of course, for everybody. I just want to thank really quickly all of our speakers and supporters that joined us today to share their stories and their own calls for action. I hope everybody is listening. This legislative session, we are thinking and we're dreaming big. I heard that surplus mentioned. Um, and we are positioned to take significant steps forward to creating a more equitable future for young children and their families in Minnesota. Um, right now, I need you to ask yourself, what is the future that you want for your children, for our children, right? Our representatives need to hear your stories. There is an action alert that we will share in the chat, and we encourage everybody to sign on to it. And second, we hope that you have fun with the Dream Big Art Project. This is my daughter. She recommends sequins. Um, we have letters and information about how to participate on the event page. We'll put that in the chat as well um, and post that out after the fact. And lastly, keep using our hashtag, our children and men. Lift up your stories. Make sure that your voices are heard. The time is now. Thank you so much again for coming. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon uh, and take care. Bye, everyone.